U.S. Navy History arriving. Welcome back to the U.S. Navy History Podcast. My name is Dale, and the XO is being distracted right now by his puppy. Hey, Stephen. Hey there, everyone. Cleo says hello. She, uh, hey, Cleo. She is insisting that I give her pets. Anytime I try and move my hand away, she just immediately just practically grabs my hand and forces it back to her neck. Mm-mm. Ah, to be loved. I mean, I could do with a little less right now, but at the same time, she is precious. <laughs> yes. So we are diving into the theaters and battles of the Civil War. After almost a month of being away from it, because apparently ironclads are a bit deeper of a subject than we initially expected. But it was very fascinating, and it was fun. Incredibly. So we are going to start with the Union Blockade. So, are you ready to get underway? Let's cast off. All right. So, on April 19th of 1861, President Lincoln issued a proclamation of blockade against Southern ports. And this was three days after Fort Sumter, right? Fort Sumter was April 12th to 13th. Okay, so a week after. I don't know why the 16th was in my brain. Because of Cleo? Nope. May and January well, for her. Uh, <laughs> well, the proclamation goes like this. Whereas an insurrection against the government of the United States has broken out in the states of South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Mississippi, Louisiana, and Texas, and the laws of the United States for the collection of revenue cannot be effectively executed therein comfortably to that provision of the Constitution which requires duties to be uniform throughout the United States. And whereas a combination of persons engaged in such insurrection have threatened to grant pretended letters of marquee to authorize the bearers thereof to commit assaults on the lives, vessels, and property of good citizens of the country, lawfully engaged in commerce on the high seas, and in the waters of the United States, and whereas an executive proclamation had already been issued, requiring the persons engaging in these disorderly proceedings to desist therefrom, calling out a militia force for the purpose of repossessing the same, and convening Congress in extraordinary session to deliberate and determine thereon. Now, therefore, I, Abraham Lincoln, President of the United States, with a view to the same purposes before mentioned, and to the protection of the public peace, and the lives and property of quiet and orderly citizens pursuing their lawful occupations, until Congress shall have assembled and deliberated on the said unlawful proceedings, or until the same shall cease, have further deemed it advisable to set foot on blockade of the ports within the states aforesaid, in pursuant of the laws of the United States and the laws of the nations, in such case provided, for this purpose a complainant force will be posted so as to prevent entrance and exit of vessels from the ports aforesaid. If, therefore, with a view to violate such blockade, a vessel, shall, a vessel shall approach or shall attempt to leave either of the said ports, she will be duly warned by the commander of one of the blockading vessels, who will endorse on her register the fact and date of such warning. And if the same vessel shall again attempt to enter or leave the blockaded port, she will be captured and sent to the nearest convenient port for such proceedings against her and her cargo as prize, as may be deemed advisable. And I thereby proclaim and declare that if any person under the pretended authority of the said states, or under any other pretense, shall molest a vessel of the United States, or the persons or cargo on board of her, such person will be held amenable to the laws of the United States for the prevention and punishment of piracy. In witness thereof, I have here unto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed. Done at the city of Washington this 19th day of April in the year of our Lord 1861 and of the independence of the United States the 85th. 
So translated from grandiose, you know, political speech and uh, legalese, he has it on good authority that the seceding states are, you know, trying to issue letters of mark saying, hey, American goods, American shipping, American naval vessels, fair game. Go get them, boys. And never mind the violence that has been occurring. And since this is the 1860s and Congress can't exactly get there quickly or, you know, get there virtually, because Zoom won't be invented for about 150-some years, he's pretty much saying, I'm exercising my authority as president, as the head of the armed forces, to say, guys, blockade that. Anybody tries to get through, give them a warning. They push the issue. Take them. Yeah. Once Congress gets here, we can have a, you know, sit down and figure out what we actually want to do. Right. Now, here's the thing about this. This announcement of a blockade, this pretty much said, we recognize the Confederate States of America as an independent national entity because countries don't blockade their own ports. They close them. Oops. Yeah. But under international law and maritime law, nations did have the right to stop and search neutral ships in international waters if they were suspected of violating a blockade. This is something that port closures would not allow. So pretty much it's he either declares the ports closed and hopes foreign nations, you know, listen to that. Or he just says, yeah, it's a blockade. Can you, yeah. can you not, please? Because they wanted to avoid conflict between the U.S. and Britain over searching British merchant vessels mm -hmm. that they think is trading with the Confederacy. So they needed the privileges of international law, which came with the declaration of a blockade. Now, since they did declare that the Confederate States of America to be belligerents rather than insurrectionists, the international law would not be legally eligible for recognition uh, by foreign powers. So Lincoln opened the way for European powers such as British, such as Britain and France to recognize the Confederacy. But Britain's proclamation of neutrality was consistent with the position of the Lincoln administration under international law and the Confederate Sea, giving them the right to obtain loans and buy arms from other neutral powers and giving the British the formal right to discuss openly which side they wanted to support if they wanted to support any side. So, you know, the blockade had its benefits and its drawbacks. Well, damned if you do, damned if you don't. Better to have, you know, some a military presence down there, even if it, in a roundabout way, accidentally, in legalese speak, gives a little bit of authenticity to people trying to make their own nation. But, yeah, he, he said states in rebellion, like, it was never... We recognize the Confederate States of America, or it's like, no, no, they, they're they being riffraff and, you know, raising hell. We kind of need to put a stop to it because we tried being nice and they aren't getting the message. So now we have to be a little mean. Hence why legalese is its own language. Mm. <laughs> so let's get into the scope of these operations. So a joint Union Military Navy Commission, known as the Blockade Strategy Board, was formed to develop plans for seizing key southern ports to use as Union bases of operations to, you know, expand the blockade. The initial phase of the blockade was that the Union forces wanted to concentrate on the Atlantic coast. And so in November of 1861, they captured Port Royal in South Carolina, providing the Union with a open ocean port and repair and maintenance facility in, you know, good operating condition. So it becomes an early base of operations for further expansion of the blockade along the Atlantic coastline. 
which included the Stone Fleet. Now, Appalachia, Florida, received Confederate goods traveling down the Chattahoochee River from Columbus, Georgia, and it was, you know, an early target of Union blockade efforts on the Florida coast. Well, and a lot easier to get Another, to from places like, uh, you know, New York or Boston compared to something like, you know, why am I drawing a blank on the Mississippi city? Jacksonville. No. Mm, that's in Florida. That gummit. New Orleans, then. That's in Louisiana. That's in but Louisiana. A, a major Confederate port in the Gulf of Mexico. Okay. Another early capture was Ship Island, which gave the Navy a base to patrol the entrances to both the Mississippi River and to Mobile Bay. And then the Navy gradually extends its reach throughout the Gulf of Mexico to Texas, which included, you know, Galveston and the Sabine Pass. Now, there are 3,500 miles of Confederate coastline with around 180 possible ports of entry that they had to patrol and blockade. So, of course, this is going to be the largest blockade effort ever attempted. So, how many ships did the U.S. Navy have to work with to cover over 3,000 miles of coastline? 42 active and 48 in reserve. Okay, so 100 once, you know, the t guys in reserve are able to get out. So, every ship... 90. There's... Yeah, oh, yep, yep, math. Math is hard. <laughs> yeah, I told you. I told you. You did. You really did. So that's over 30 miles between ships. How are they expecting to, uh, you know, maintain a good blockade? And Because you want to be having line of sight or at least clear communication from one ship to another if you're going to, you know, daisy chain and pretty much cut it off from all outside, you know, ships coming in. Hence the difficulty of the scope of this blockade. Mm. And you also have to understand half of these ships were sailing vessels. And a lot of them were pretty much technologically outdated. Uh, a number of these were also at the time that this conflict started patrolling out somewhere else in the world. One of them was on Lake Erie and, you know, couldn't be put into the ocean. Uh, there was one that had gone missing off of Hawaii. Oh, straight up missing. So at the time of the blockade declaration, the Union only had three ships suitable for blockade duty. Whoops. So the, the Navy had to move quickly to expand the fleet. And the warships that were patrolling abroad had to be recalled. So a huge, huge shipping program was launched. Civilian, merchant, and passenger ships were purchased to put into naval service. And captured blockade runners were commissioned into the Navy as well. So in early 1861, nearly 80 steamers and 60 sailing ships were added to the fleet. So the number of blockading vessels rose to 160, and 52 more warships were constructed by the end of the year. So that by November of 1862, there were 282 steamships and 102 sailing ships operating. And by the end of the war, the Union Navy had grown to 671 ships making it the largest navy in the world. Take that, British. So, at the end of 61, the navy had grown to 24,000 officers and enlisted men, and over 15,000 more in antebellum service. They had four squadrons deployed, two in the Atlantic and two in the Gulf of Mexico. So, blockade service was attractive to seamen and landsmen alike because blockade station service was considered the most boring job in the war <laughs> but was very attractive in terms of potential financial gain 
so low risk and because technically you'd be anything you catch would be prize and this was back in the era where that was a bonus yes so the task for the fleet was to sail back and forth and to intercept any blockade runners more than 50,000 men volunteered for this quote boring duty <laughs> And, of course, food and living conditions on ships was much better than what the infantry had to contend with. The work was safer, and because of a real chance, although it was a small chance, to get some big money. Because, as you mentioned, captured ships and their cargoes were sold at auction and the proceedings split amongst the sailors. Not a bad deal at all. No, not at all. So, for example, when a boat called the Alias seized and captured a blockade runner off of the coast of North Carolina called the Hope, mm -hmm. the captain won $13,000, which is about $196,000 today. The chief engineer, 6700 and the little the little seamen each got like a thousand bucks. And even the cabin boy got like five hundred and thirty three dollars. You know, that's a pretty decent bonus for a cabin boy. Right. And the infantry, they got thirteen dollars per month. Oh, oh wow. Yeah. Now, I mean, the amount you get can vary depending on, you know, what you catch. While one boat can sell, sell for like 50 bucks, mm -hmm. a bigger boat can bring in like $510,000, which is about $7.7 .7 million today. Jeez. In four years, $25 million in prize money was awarded. That's in 1860s money, right? Yes. Good time to be a member of that blockading crew. So... As you can imagine, because, you know, 3,500 miles of coastline, a lot of blockade runners did manage to evade the Union ships. Now, of course, as the fleet builds up, it's going to get harder and harder. And so they found that the most, that the type of ship that was most likely to exceed in, invade, in evading the naval fleets was small light ships with a, you know, shallow draft mm -hmm. now the downside to using these boats was that the they couldn't carry a large amount of you know heavy weapons metals and a lot of other supplies that the south needed very badly all they could really do was foodstuffs and maybe ammo or gunpowder well it's just you can't take as much right so it's it's not what they brought, it's they had to bring it, they had to bring less of it. Mm, okay. So to be successful, these blockade runners had to make a lot of trips, which means more trips, more chances to get caught. So most of these guys were eventually captured or sunk. Usually they were successful five out of six times. That's not the worst record. About 1,500 blockade runners were captured or destroyed during the war. Do we know how many were active or have a guesstimate? 1,500? <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so ordinary freighters were, of course, very slow and very visible to the Navy. So they were not very good to use. So they relied mainly on new steamships built by Britain. With low profile, with low profile, shallow draft, and you know, quote high speed, but in this, you know, in this time, high speeds not the speeds we see today. Right. They were mainly paddle wheel driven, and burned the smokeless anthracite coal, so they made about seventeen knots. And you know, if they're burning smokeless coal. They're putting out less of a profile to be spotted by the Navy lookouts. Right. So because the South lacked, you know, sailors, 
captains and, you know, shipbuilding capability. <laughs> the runners were pretty much built, commanded, and manned by British officers and sailors. Private British investors spent around 50 million pounds on the runners. Oh, wow. Or, or 250 million in U.S. dollars, which is the equivalent to about two and a half billion dollars in 2006. What the heck? Right. So, yeah, they spent about two and a half billion dollars on blockade runners. The British did. And the pay that these guys were getting was actually pretty high. A Royal Navy officer on leave might earn several thousand dollars in salary in gold. Oh, and bonuses while ordinary seamen were earning several hundred dollars. So these blockade runners were based in the British Isles of Bermuda and the Bahamas and in Havana and in Spanish Cuba. Now the goods that they carried were brought to them by, you know, ordinary cargo ships and they were loaded onto these runners. Then they ran the gauntlet between the bases and the Confederate ports, which were between five and 700 miles apart. On each of these trips, they would carry several hundred tons of compact, high-value cargo, like cotton, turpentine, tobacco, and on the, you know, going outbound and inbound, they were getting rifles, medicine, brandy, and coffee. They also had mail a lot of times. Oh. And they charged from three to one thousand dollars per ton of cargo. I mean, you're so risking life and limb, literally. <clears throat> so can't really blame them. So two round trips a month would generate around two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in revenue. Eighty thousand of this was in wages and expenses. Now of course Blockade runners preferred to run at night, either on a moonless night or before the moon rose or after a set, you know, so they could easier to avoid seen. getting spotted. Yeah. Now, as they approached the coastline, they had no lights going and the sailors were prohibited from smoking because at night you could see a light a long way away on the ocean, especially on a moonless one. Yeah. But on the other hand, the Union warships all covered their lights as well. If a Union warship discovers a blockade runner, it fired a signal rocket in the direction of what course it was on to alert other ships in the area. So the runners adopted tactics by firing their own rockets in a different direction to confuse the Union warships. That's actually pretty clever. Yeah, not bad at all. So, in November of 1864, there was a wholesaler in Wellington, and he was, like, talking to his agent in the Bahamas, telling him, you know what, you guys need to stop sending so much chloroform, and you need instead to bring essence of cognac, because that perfume's going to sell white high. Why? Money. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, money. Now, Confederate patriots, they held these rich blockade runners in contempt because they were profiteering on luxuries while the soldiers that were fighting the war were, you know, in rags. But, you know, on the other hand, their bravery was necessary for the nation's survival. So many women in the backcountry flaunted imported $10 gigas and $50 hats as patriotic proof that the, quote, damn Yankees had failed to isolate them from the outer world. <laughs> uh. And so, you know, a giga is just, you know, something that's a showy item. Right, right. It's just, you know, sh let me show you how rich and affluent I am. 
so the government in Richmond, they eventually regulated the traffic. They required half the imports to be munitions. It even purchased and operated some, uh, some runners on their own. And they made sure that they were loaded with vital war goods. So by 1864, Lee's soldiers were eating imported meat. And blockade running was reasonably safe for both sides. It was, you know, not illegal under international law. So captured foreign sailors were released. Uh, Confederate uh, prisoners were sent to prison camps. Now, these ships were unarmed because, you know, the weight of the cannons would slow them down. Yeah. So, you know, they, they pose no danger to Navy warships. So being fired upon was not a real big danger. Pretty much pull over to the curb. Pull over to the curb. Yeah. So there is an example of a lucrative, albeit short-lived, nature of the blockade running, which was a trade ship called the Banshee. Okay. She operated out of Nassau and the Bahamas. She was captured on her seventh run into Wilmington. She was confiscated by the U.S. Navy for use as a blockading ship. Now, at the time of her capture, she had just turned a 700% profit for her English owners. Oh, very nice. Who quickly commissioned and built the Banshee number two. <laughs> which, you know, joined the fleet of blockade runners very quickly. The last Confederate ship to blo to run the blockade was in May of 1865, and she slipped out of a southern port and evaded the un Union blockade when she left Galveston, Texas for Havana. Hmm. Okay. So the Union blockade was a powerful weapon that, you know, eventually ruined the southern economy at the cost of not very many lives. The measure of the blockade success was not the number of ships that slipped through, but the thousands that never tried it. Because they didn't want to risk you know, going to prison. Yeah, well, I mean, ordinary freighters had no hope of evading the blockade, so they just stopped going to the southern ports. And the interdiction of coastal traffic meant that long-distance travel depended on the rickety railroad system which, you know, never overcame the devastating impact of the blockade. So throughout the war, the South produced enough food for civilians and soldiers, but it had difficulty more and more in moving these foodstuffs that was needed to the areas that needed it. And of course, since Lee's army was at the end of the supply line, there was pretty much always short of supplies as, you know, the war got older and older. So by the tail end of the war, not only were all of these big southern ports captured, which we haven't even touched on yet, but sorry, spoilers, folks, but those captains and ships, some local, a lot foreign, because, hey, money, money. 700% profit. Yeah, yeah. Had at that point been captured, as we are getting in the last year and change of the war. Well, I mean, also, as the war grows on, the fleet, U.S. Navy fleet increases inside, which makes it harder and harder to get through as well. Yeah, slipping past four on over 3,000 miles of coastline, a lot easier than, you know, at the end of the war. Largest Navy, you said? Yes. So by 1864, it was estimated that one in every three ships attempting to run the blockade were being intercepted. So, you know, in the final two years of war, only the ships with that had a reasonable chance of getting through the blockade were specifically designed for speed. So because of this, the blockade pretty much totally choked off southern cotton exports which, you know, the Confederacy depended on for currency. Yeah. That was their main cash crop. So cotton exports fell 95% from 10 million bales in three year, in the three years prior to the war 
just 500,000 bales during the blockade period. What? Yeah. That is insane. I mean, incredibly effective, but holy crap. The blockade also largely reduced imports of food, medicine, war materials, manufactured goods, and luxury items, revol- resulting, of course, in severe shortage and inflation. Shortages of bread led to occasional bread riots in Richmond and other cities, showing that patriotism was not sufficient to satisfy the demands of housewives. <laughs> Land routes did remain open for cattle drovers, but after the Union seized control of the Mississippi River, it, ga- it became impossible to ship horses, cattle, and swine from Texas and Arkansas to the Confederacy that was in the East. So the blockade ultimately was a triumph of the U.S. Navy and was a major factor in winning the war. So you're probably saying, well, what did the Confederacy do in response to this, right? I mean, I am curious. They constructed torpedo boats. These tended to be small, fast steam launches equipped with spar torpedoes. These were not mines. These were spar torpedoes. An actual proper, by modern definition, torpedo. No. These were were attached to the front of the boat by long poles. Oh, oh, the jousting. Yes, jousting torpedoes. And they used these to attack the blockading fleet. How'd that go? Well, these torpedo boats tried to attack under cover of night by ramming the, okay, jousting torpedoes into the hulls of the blockading ships. And then, you know, backing off and detonating the explosive. They were not very effective and were actually easily countered by simple measures, such as hanging chains over the sides of the ship to foul the screws of the torpedo boats or encircling the ships with wooden booms to trap the torpedoes at a distance. Curses, foiled by ingenuity again. Now, there was a historic, notable naval battle, which was the attack of the CSS H.L. Huntley, which was a hand-powered submarine. Oh, hey, didn't we use those in the Revolution, too? Well, after the... We're done with the... Civil War, we'll go back to the Revolution and find out. How about that? Sounds good. Okay. So this submarine was launched from Charleston in South Carolina and used against Union blockade ships. On the night of February 17th of 1865, the Huntley attacked the Houstonic, and the Houstonic sank with the loss of five crew members. Unfortunately, the Huntley also sank, taking her crew of eight to the bottom. Oh. So what happened was that the Huntley had a star, had a barbed spar potato torpedo mm-hmm. and embedded it into the Houstonic's hull. The torpedo detonated as the submarine backed away. It prematurely detonated. Okay. And that's why she was damaged and sunk. When uh, they found the wreck of the Houstonic divers went down and examined it. They found Huntley just a few yards away with all eight crew members on board her. So she almost made it to her target. Oh, she made it to her target. She just didn't make it uh, away from the target after carrying out her attack. Oh, okay. So the first victory for the Navy during the first part of the blockade occurred on April 24th, 1861 when the sloop Cumberland and a small flotilla of supporting ships began seizing Confederate ships and privateers in the vicinity of Fort Monroe off of the Virginia coastline. And within two weeks, the fleet had captured 16 enemy vessels. Holy crap. That is pretty dang good for two weeks. Yeah, this pretty much told the Confederate War Department that uh, if this blockade gets bigger, it's going to be very, very effective. Get good. Yeah. 
So in early March of 1862, the blockade of the same of the James River in Virginia was threatened by the first ironclad, the CSS Virginia. And this was at the Battle of Hampton Roads. This was the this is when the uh the monitor came and forestalled the threat. And then two months later, the Virginia and other ships of the James River Squadron were pretty much scuttled in response to the Union Army and Navy advances. So, since we got there with the Battle of the Hampton Roads, you want to go into it real quick? Let's do it. I think we have time for one battle. So, the battle begins when the USS or when the CSS Virginia steams into the Hampton Roads area on the morning of March 8th, 1862. Captain Buchanan wanted to attack as quickly as he could. So the Virginia was accompanied with by the by the Raleigh and the Beaufort, and then was joined at Hampton Roads by the James River Squadron, which compromised the Patrick Henry, the Jamestown, and the Teaser. So when they were passing the Union batteries at Newport News, mm-hmm. The Patrick Henry was actually temporarily disabled by a shot into her boiler that killed four of her crew, but she was repaired and rejoined the others. So at the same time, the Union Navy had five warships in the area, in addition to several support vessels, the sloop of war USS Cumberland and the frigate Congress were anchored in a channel near Newport News. And the frigate St. Lawrence and the steam frigates Roanoke and Minnesota were near Fort Monroe, along, along with the store ship USS Brandywine. Do you think they were drunk all the time? Or, you know, maybe they were just fans of Tolkien. You know, Brandywine River. I don't know. Both? Both. Both is good. Okay. Now, these last three got underway as soon as they saw the Virginia approaching, but they also ran aground pretty quickly. And so the St. Lawrence and Renault didn't have anything else to do during the battle because they were stuck. I mean, did they just not have good maps showing where uh, shoals or sandbars would be, or were they a little distracted? That That's a pretty big oopsie. Well, you see an ironclad coming for you. What are you going to do? Get the hell out of there, but be aware that I shouldn't be sailing into sandbars or shoals. Well, then you should have been captain of one of these boats. I wouldn't have been. South is too hot and humid for me. (laughs) So the Virginia, she headed directly for the Union Squadron. And the battle started when the Union tug, Zouave, fired on the enemy that is advancing towards them. So the Beaufort replies. And this opening fire really had no effect on either side. They were just not hitting each other. Now, Virginia, she held her fire. She just kept creeping closer and closer. Was she going for a ram? She wanted to wait until she was very close to the Cumberland, so she wouldn't miss. Listen, uh, I know during the Revolution, wait till you see the whites of their eyes, you know, that, that whole thing. Can't miss if you're that close. Well, then again, it's an ironclad. So that's the army, though. And the Navy, it's hold fire until you see their rivets. Okay. Um, As someone (laughs) who needs glasses, no, you don't want to wait till I can see the rivets. (laughs) If I can see the rivets, I'm kissing the ship at that point. I can't miss. That's fair. But we have other problems then. Right. Well, after the Virginia opens fire on the Cumberland, the Cumberland and Congress return fire and see their shots bouncing off the iron plates. Virginia then picks up speed and rams the Cumberland below the waterline and she goes down pretty quickly. But she is quoted to gallantly firing her guns as long as they were above the water. <laughs> When she went down, she took 121 men down with her. Oh. With the wounded added to that, the casualty total on the Cumberland were 150. 
Now, when the Virginia rammed the Cumberland, it almost took out the Virginia as well because the Virginia's bow ram got stuck in the Cumberland. And as the Cumberland began listing and going down, she almost pulled the Virginia down with her. While the vessels were locked, one of the Cumberland's anchors were hanging directly above the foredeck of the Virginia. Had she dropped the anchor, the two ships would probably have gone down together. Fortunately or unfortunately, depending on which side you're on, the Virginia breaks free. But she lost her ram as she backed away. So the Virginia then turns towards the Congress. Now, the Congress saw what happened to Cumberland. And the captain of the Congress, Joseph B. Smith, orders his ship grounded in shallow water. He's like, you ain't ramming me. I mean, I know I literally just said, why would you ground yourself? But, eh, huh, that seems like a decent idea to avoid being rammed. So, at this time, the James River Squadron arrives and joins Virginia in the attack on the Congress. And after about an hour of, you know, very lopsided combat, mm -hmm. the Congress surrenders because, you know, at this time she's very, very damaged. So they start taking the survivors off of the Congress. The A Union battery on the North Shore opens fire on the Virginia. So the Virginia says, you know what? Load some hot shot. Well. And finish off the Congress. Certainly not messing around anymore. So Congress catches fire and burns pretty much the rest of the day. About midnight, the flames reach her magazine and she just explodes. So on the Congress, there were 110 dead or missing and 26 wounded. Ten of these die within the next few days. Now, you know, she hasn't suffered much damage. Like, you know, the damage she inflicted on these other two. She, you know, wasn't completely unscathed. Some shots from the Cumberland and Congress and the shore battery had riddled her smokestack. So dense chip paint, you know, maybe some minor damage that would need to be repaired once you got into port, but nothing that affects the performance. Actually, this does affect her speed. Oh. Yeah. Uh, two of her guns were also disabled, and several armor plates had been loosened. Oh, okay. So she's actually wounded in the water right now. A little bit. She lost two crew members, and a few more of them were wounded. One of them being the captain. Oh. Yeah, his uh, left thigh was pierced by rifle shot. So the James River Squadron now turns its attention to the Minnesota, which had left Fort Monroe to join the battle, but had run aground. So once the Virginia was done with Congress, she also joins the James River Squadron. But because of her deep draft and the tide going out, she was not able to get close enough to be effective. And of course, darkness kind of, you know, stop their rest of the squadron from aiming their guns to be able to hit mm -hmm. the Minnesota with any of uh, any detrimental effect. So they pretty much were like, okay, we're done for the night. So the Virginia steams away, planning to come back the next day and finishing off the Minnesota. All right. She goes and retreats to the safety of Confederate-controlled waters off of Seawells Point for the night. Yep. She had killed about 400 enemy sailors and only lost two of their own. So, of course, this was considered really successful for her. That, that is a good military sailing performance. They had also destroyed two ships and three were run aground. So, yeah, this was very successful for them. This was the United States Navy's greatest defeat until World War II. 
and it caused panic in Washington. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you were just expecting to, you know, roll over, you know, the rebellion and have a splendid little war before year's end, that, that is a wake up call. It scared the ever living poop out of the secretary of war, a guy named Edwin Stanton. He started going around telling others that the Virginia might attack the East Coast, their cities, and, oh my lord, they might even shell the White House. Okay, first rule of being in war, don't run around saying crap like that, raising a panic. Now there was a cooler head, a guy named Willis. He goes around and assures his colleagues that they were safe because the boat could not go up the Potomac. And he said, also, guess what? We have an ironclad. And it was going right now after the Virginia. So don't worry. Okay, guys? Calm the F down. Just chill. Okay, it's fine. So the next day, you know, the Virginia puts her wounded ashore, licks her wounds, you know, makes repairs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the captain was among the wounded, so... The XO took command. Lieutenant Stephen, I mean, Lieutenant Caspi <laughs> Roger Jones. And, of course, Jones is no less aggressive than Captain Buchanan. So, while Virginia is preparing herself for battle, and while Congress is still on fire, Monitor, commanded by Lieutenant John L. Warden, arrives in Hampton Roads. The ironclad had been pushed underway quickly, trying to get there in time to protect the Union fleet and, you know, to prevent the Virginia from threatening Union cities. He was, the captain was informed that his primary task was to protect Minnesota. So the monitor takes up position near the Minnesota and waits. Okay. So, the next morning at dawn on March 9th, the Virginia leaves her anchorage at Sewell's Point and moves to attack the Minnesota, who was still run aground. She was followed by the James River Squadron, and then they see that they can't get to the Minnesota because there's the Monitor right in their way. So, at first, Lieutenant Jones was like, what the hell is that? They weren't supposed to have one, too. That looks like a cheese on a raft. <laughs> so they didn't realize what they were looking at. So they were like, what's going... Oh, crap. Because... They have one, too. They figured it out pretty quick when they got fired on. Because as they were standing there confused, Monitor opened fired. The Virginia also fires, and the shot flies past Monitor and strikes the Minnesota, which answered with its own broadside. So this is going to be the start of a length, lengthy, lengthy battle. The fight lasted for hours, mostly at close range. You know, this is the famous... Bouncing off of the Monitor and Virginia, bouncing their shots off of each other. Sounds like uh, the world's most dangerous game of uh, dodgeball. Yeah. They did not really expect to fight, you know, other armored vessels. So, at least in the Virginia case, his guns were supplied only with, with shell shot rather than armor-piercing shot. Hmm. And Monitor's guns were used with the standard 15 pounds of powder, which is the standard service charge back then, yeah. which did not give them sufficient momentum to penetrate the Virginia's hull. They later did tests and found that their guns could be operated safely and effectively with charges up, up to 30 pounds, which probably would have been a game changer during that battle if they had known that. That would certainly have launched a lot more force. So the battle finally came to a close when a lucky shot from Virginia struck the pilot house of the Monitor 
and exploded, driving fragments of iron through the viewing slits into the captain's eyes, oh. blinding him. Only temporarily, though. Oh, okay. So this wasn't a blind for life deal. This wasn't permanent, no. So because, you know, everybody's temporarily blinded, they are forced to to uh, retreat. The XO takes over and the monitor comes back to the fight again. So now it's XO versus XO. So this can only end in disaster. No offense, XO. Oh, come on. We got this. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. So when the Virginia sees the monitor retreat, because, you know, nobody can see right then and there. Right. This made them think that they had officially withdrawn. So even though the Mon Minnesota was still aground, tide at this point had been going out. So the Virginia can't reach them. Right. And she had actually suffered enough damage to require extensive repair. So Jones, the XO of the Virginia, he was like, we won the day. Let's go home. Huzzah, huzzah. And they head back to Norfolk. And this is when Monitor returns. And they see the back end of Virginia. So they are now convinced that Virginia was quitting the fight. And since they only had orders to protect the Minnesota, they did not chase her. Hmm. So, because of all this, both sides claim victory. <laughs> we won. No, we won. Are we sure about that? Yeah, the Confederate Secretary of the Navy wrote to the Confederate President, quote, The conduct of the officers and men of the squadron reflects unfading honor upon themselves and upon the Navy. The report will be read with deep interest, as its details will not fail to rouse the ardor and nerve the arms of our gallant seamen. It will be remembered that the Virginia was a novelty in naval architecture, wholly unlike any ship that ever floated, that her heaviest gun were equal novelties in ordnance, and her motive power and obedience to her helm were untried and her officers and crew strangers comparatively to the ship and to each other. And yet, under all these disadvantages, the dashing courage and consummate professional ability of Flag Officer Buchanan and his associates achieved the most remarkable victory which naval annuals record. Hmm. Now, in Washington, they believed that the monitor, that the monitor had vanquished Virginia, and they thought this so strongly that Warden and his men were awarded the thanks of Congress. Quote, Resolved that the thanks of Congress and the American people are due and are hereby tendered to Lieutenant L.J. Warden of the United States Navy and to the officers and men of the ironclad gunboat Monitor under his command, for the skill and gallantry exhibited by them in the remarkable battle between the Monitor and the rebel ironclad steamer Merrimack. They didn't even have the name right. Oh, that's fantastic. So the two-day engagement, the Minnesota shot off 78 rounds of 10-inch solid shot. 68 rounds of 10-inch solid shot with 15-second fuses. And 169 rounds of 9-inch solid shot. 189-inch shells with 15-second fuses, and 35 8-inch shells with 15-second fuses, and 5,567 and a half pounds of powder. Three men were killed and 16 were wounded. So that is that battle. So the monitor showed up after the Virginia had its fun. They played extreme dodgeball for keepsies. Both limped away, and they're like, we got him. When really, neither got him. Right. But the Virginia did a massive amount of damage that first day. It, yeah. Well, like we covered in the uh, Ironclad episode, an Ironclad versus a wooden ship wasn't even a fight. It was just 
you know, sixth graders bullying the new kid in kindergarten. Yeah. Or even worse, you know, like shooting sailors in a barrel. Mm hmm. So I think that's where we're going to end it for today. After next time, we're going to continue with the the blockade and eh, blockade theater and then we'll be moving on to the eastern theater so how are you feeling exo i'd say i'm feeling pretty good um we finally covered that first ironclad on ironclad fight only took a month <laughs> well you were so excited about the ironclad period that we <laughs> we, we we took some time to to cover them in depth just for you. And I really appreciate it because it was cool. So any complaints that it took us this long to get to the battles, go ahead and write the XO and, and tell them what you think. I can take it. Where, where can they do that at XO? Well, first of all, if you want to make it really personal, we have a Discord server now. You can find that link in the show notes. I will respond to, uh, you know, duels for honor. Though, as the challenged party, I will get to choose weapons, and I'm fond of weird, unorthodox ones. Yeah, I see a lot of 3D chess in the future. Oh, no, 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 no. We gotta get that fourth dimension in there, man. You're giving me a look, That's but it, it exists. Oh, I know. I've seen Okay. Them. If you want to make it hey, more public, there's... you can also uh, tweet at us. And that can be reached at USN History Pod. If you'd like to email us, you can do so at U.S. Navy History Podcast at gmail.com. And also, we would love for you guys to leave a review, give us some stars, whether it's one star, five star. You know, we appreciate hearing your thoughts on what we could do, be doing better, what we're doing well. And it helps more people find the podcast. If you'd like, we can even read your review on the air. Absolutely. So, until next time, fair winds and the following sea. See you later, guys. And don't build your battleship as a bumper car. Oh, yeah, yeah. The uh, SS U.S. Navy History Podcast uh, did unfortunately sink on her maiden voyage. I told you. It was a glorious 30 seconds, though. We were masters of the waves. Yeah, and you're the one writing the letters to the men that didn't make it out. I'm not doing it this time. N no men were lost. Everyone had their life preservers on. Bye, everybody. See you, folks. U.S. Naval History Podcast, departing 2-1-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-2-